Sorry, it's fine. Yeah. There's so much of this. What is it? Okay. Welcome to tonight's yeah. workshop for Thursday, January 23rd. May I please have the attendance? Mrs. Durkin? Here. Mrs. Giptos? Here. Dr. Gill? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Scyther? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. Ms. Caldwell? Here. And Mr. Bennett? Here. And if you join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, very excited about tonight's workshop. Um, we are going to have a presentation regarding renewable energy, the Renewable Energy Consortium for Cost Savings on District Electricity. And Todd, if you'd like to introduce our guest. Great. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this. Um, we've been, the school department's been working with competitive energy uh, for several years now, and Charlie Agnew is our representative. They help us procure utilities, uh, gas, electric, and heating oil. Um, and for years, as Kate will be my witness, I've been trying to find a way to make renewable energy an affordable, cost-saving measure for the school department. As a quick um, overview, we spend more than half a million dollars on electricity alone for the whole district every year. And um, the com folks at Competitive Energy have helped us procure the best pricing um, at the right time, which is all, always key. And recently with new legislation uh, at the state level, uh, it allows for larger solar projects or renewable energy projects. And Charlie is here to present uh, an opportunity for the school department to join a consortium a group of people participating in a large variety of projects, mostly solar but some hydro, um, which could yield uh, significant savings for us. So I will introduce Charlie Agnew, who knows a lot more than I do about this stuff. And it's been five years that we've been working together. Um, most of these years I've been explaining to Todd why solar does not work financially. Um, it's true. That's been kind of our, our focus. Uh, but you know, as of last June, we had some legislation that passed in the state of Maine that um, it did change that economic or financial picture pretty dramatically. And so you know, we've been talking about it. That, that, that came right up uh, as soon as some of these bills, a couple of bills were passed uh, last spring. And um, internally at, at Competitive Energy Services, uh, we represent, uh, I think, close to 375 or so <clears throat> institutions in the state of Maine, public and private, uh, large and small, you know, school districts, municipalities, you know, the L.L. Beans, the uh, University of Maine uh, system, you know, Hannaford Brothers, uh, Pratt & Whitney, you know, a, a diverse group of, of customers who uh, we immediately polled to see who is interested in essentially going out to market and uh, finding what sort of uh, cost it would take to develop solar in the state of Maine um, and uh, compare that up against what the, essentially the value of that solar that um, a, a customer like the, the Scarborough Schools or anyone else uh, could extract from these projects under the new legislation. <coughs> so um, kind of at a high level, we, we grouped together uh, two dozen of our, our key clients, some of those I've already mentioned. Um, we went out to bid on behalf of this group for uh, close to 300,000 um, megawatt hours per year of uh, electric load. And um, that's essentially the process that I plan to, plan to describe tonight, what we've done for due diligence to get to the point where we're at, uh, the timeline going forward, and, and what we um, are expecting from all the participants in that RFP process, which I'll refer to as the consortium of, of uh, participants, and we can talk through some of the economic, environmental benefits and answer any questions you guys have. That sounds good. 
and plan to wrap by the hour, I guess, so a little bit before that. So this usually takes me about an hour, so I'm going to go a little quick and just need you guys to stop me to um, uh, just stop me to ask any questions or, or for any clarifications. But um, it might be helpful just to summarize, like what, what we're looking uh, or, or what sort of relationship the school district. Uh, would be entering into if you do decide to move forward with a solar project. Just to outline the general structure of that. Um, first of all, we we do not expect any capital outlay, first, first and foremost. Um, this uh, uh, agreement structure that we are, are seeking with a number of different solar developers is one where you will contract for the output of roughly 25 different solar and hydro facilities and essentially receive uh, monetary credits from the utility. So Central Maine Power uh, will issue you uh, a, a line item credit um, for the production from these hydro and solar facilities. And then the school district would pay back the developer uh, for those credits that were received on the central main power bills. So that's an important kind of relationship to, to hammer home here. So, uh, so essentially, you enter a long-term contract with the developer to, to buy the output from the facility. They use that contract to finance uh, construct and then operate and own the solar or hydro facility for a 20-year period. These projects are going to get built all throughout the state of Maine and through your participation you will receive credits, dollar value credits on the utility bill and then pay a portion of that back to the developers. So, uh, let's just wanted to make sure we got the answer to so just to clarify when you talk about building solar or hydro are you talking about that like in some random place in Maine or like in our district yep that's an important point so this these projects are not going to be built in Scarborough we, none of the projects that we've selected and I'll get into the details of where we are with this process but None of them will be on school property. None of them will be, I don't think, in the Scarborough area. Okay. But they will be within Central Main Power Service Tariff. That's So we're getting credit for somebody else using the sol solar power? Because I don't understand that, I guess. Yep. Yeah, you're, you know, physically, uh, you will be you know, physically accepting none of the actual right. solar. I mean, you think of the electric grid as one where... You have solar and hydro and yeah. biomass and coal and nuclear energy. It all goes on to the grid. Right. You, um, you take whatever comes off of the grid at your meter here. Um, this is, in essence, a paper agreement to uh, receive credits on your utility bill, and you will also be receiving the environmental attributes from these projects. You will, you will own those. Um, but you will not take physical delivery of the electrons. Okay, so uh, just to give an overview of the consortium, who's in it, uh, I'll run down this list just to give you a sense. Some of the other school departments are the Auburn Public Schools, Falmouth, um, Portland through the city of Portland, uh, obviously Wyndham Raymond, Scarborough, uh, those are, well, actually, yeah, those are the limits of the public schools that are in here. Some of the other highlights are Bowdoin, Colby Colleges, uh, City of Portland, Husson University, L.L. Bean, Maine Community College System, Maine General, Maine Maritime Academy, Nestle Waters, New Balance, um, Portland Water District, Pratt & Whitney, Pride Sports, Jackson Laboratory, and the University of Maine System, just to give you a sense of who the other uh, partners are on this project. And the value here, I'll, I'll, some of this will come up a little bit later, but uh, Scarborough schools are not out on your own here, and, and everyone else is following the same process and will receive essentially the same 
uh, projects that the Scarborough schools uh, will receive. So what we saw value in is putting together a large group that could go out and, and get the best prices and best projects in the marketplace. And we, and we think we've done that. Uh, this RFP uh, for the consortium went out in September. We got all our bids back on Halloween. We spent a couple of months going back and forth on some of the legal language in the actual contractual agreements with both the participants, uh, that is Scarborough Schools and, and attorneys representing your interests, as well as everyone else, all the other participants in the consortium. Uh, we have uh, gotten to a point where we have now have a draft 20-year contract that everyone in the participants has reviewed, all of the developers have reviewed, and all but one has approved that contract. So we are very close to a point right now where we will have executable uh, agreements with the developers for the participants to sign in the next couple of weeks. Um, what we asked for in this uh, uh, RFP was to, first of all, to own the environmental attributes. These are uh, the environmental attributes or renewable energy credits uh, are generated uh, by these facilities, by these solar and hydro facilities, and, and they have uh, a couple different pieces of value. One, you can retire them and own those credits and, and count them against your carbon inventory. Uh, they also have value in the marketplace where you could go out and sell those credits and increase project revenue uh, through your participation in this, in this process. The Scarborough schools will own those credits, at least initially, uh, and have the your own discretion as to whether you own them or sell them for additional uh, revenue. Um, the, con the rates that we ask for, or bids from these developers, are a fixed price without an escalator for 20 years. Um, so essentially that price is going to be based on the kilowatt hour production Kilowatt hours are a unit of electricity measurement, and for every kilowatt hour that gets generated, you will have a fixed price contract uh, for the 20 years of that agreement with each one of these projects that we'll ultimately select. Um, just to give you a sense of uh, you know, when these projects are expected to be built, we, we did have the ability to pick through 110 different projects that were proposed, which was way more than we needed to fulfill the, the needs of our consortium. Um, so we've been able to pick uh, essentially what we want out of the, uh, the group of proposals, um, which is a good thing, you know, primarily based on price, but there are, other, there are other kind of aspects to the stage of development that we're uh, evaluated. Um, and this chart in front of you just goes to show some of the uh, developers on the left-hand side, and then when we expect these projects to begin operating. Um, you know, none of them are, none of, the, none of the solar projects are built today. Uh, they will need <coughs> contracts from you all in order to finance and begin construction. And the majority of these projects are expected to be built uh, in the latter part of uh, 2020. We did also mention that there are some hydro projects that would be contracted with in this, uh, in this project, and those are already operating uh, existing facilities. And so as soon as the agreements are signed, uh, the school district would be receiving credits from those hydro facilities. But the majority of the solar projects are at least about a year out. Um, so this is just to give you kind of a, a, some geographic uh, representation of where each of these projects was proposed. Um, I'm going to skip through this just because of the interest of time here. Um, overall, the results of this process were, in our opinion, uh, favorable and as we expected. Um, nothing surprising there. We've done quite a bit of due diligence in the past two months uh, on, this, on the developers that uh, we've focused in on. 
and that is uh, roughly six or seven different developers who will be building approximately 25 different projects. Um, one thing to note here is that um, I mentioned every one of the participants in the consortium is going to be getting the same thing as the other. Um, the Scarborough schools will own a percent share of 25 different projects. You will not own output from a single facility. Uh, we've made this, um, it, it is going to be somewhat administratively uh, complex. However, uh, we think there's good reason to diversify your ownership across 25 different projects and technologies, hydro and solar. Um, and, and ultimately, you're going to own a percent share of each of those projects and, and their output. So just to give you a sense of uh, how that how that relationship is going to work. Um, so I'm just going to keep breezing through here. Any questions? So far? I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I do too. But you might I'm want right, to save them until the end. Writing down vocabulary words that Should I we pause for a couple of questions. What's the what were the statutory changes that allowed this to occur? I'll get to that. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then just to tag along on that, my question, which I'm sure you'll also get to, is what if they change back? Yep. I'll get to that. Okay. And then um, what a about, like, so right now you're saying that the projects that you have lined up are um, sufficient to fill 100% of the load in the consortium, but, like, you're looking to add us to the, con oh, wait, we're already in it? You're already in. Okay, never mind. So you're not adding members? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then, the contract. right, but we're, like, okay. And then what if, if we own a percentage of all of these projects and everybody else does, like, what happens if there's, like, a natural disaster and something sure. is destroyed? Yep. I'll get to that too. Okay. Yeah. What happens if the energy suppliers change? So you're mentioning Amera and CMP. What if they decide to pull out of, in either direction, decide to pull out of the state of Maine? Yeah. Okay. So let me let me tackle that one. That's not really in the presentation. The these are our electric. These are our um, investor-owned utilities. Amera, which is in the Bangor area, north and east, um, and then Central Maine Power, which is our uh, or, or the electric utility in the majority of southern Maine and central Maine. Um, in, in terms of, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by pulling out, uh, there's, we, you mean like no more electricity delivered in the state of Maine? I'm not saying there's no more electricity, but what if central Maine power gets bought? Gets bought. Yeah. What happens if they say, you know, we're out of this business and somebody else takes over for yeah, them? Sure. No change expected. Okay. The anyone that bought this regulated utility would be on have to operate it under the same rules that they are now under the oversight of the public utilities commission. This is a regulated public utility. Okay. Yeah. I'll make sure. Yep. And then you had mentioned about the multiple projects and then the management it, that it would be complicated to manage. Yep. Who owns the management of that? Is that something that we take on? And would we need additional resources to help support 20 various projects? Uh, under the agreement that we have with the Scarborough Schools, we are going to be doing all that administration. Okay. What, what, is, answer. Your, what is your company? Is it a... Yeah. It, like, how do you make money? Yeah, we're, we're a consulting company. No, I mean, seriously. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. So, just... Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, we are not uh, not a non for profit. Um, we wait. You are not, not a non for profit. Yeah, we're, we. I mean, we are a for profit okay. company. Yeah. yeah. Um, so <laughs> I might have confused myself. Um, so yeah, in, in this arrangement, uh, we came to Todd and said, "Here's here's here's our offer to support you guys with this. We're under this new legislation." So, do a bunch of work up front, which will be running an RFP process and including the Scarborough schools in that. Uh, we will assist in negotiating the contracts with these developers, getting you to a point of execution of one of these contracts uh, for no upfront costs. So everything that we've done since September, essentially till now, is, is you know, free. 
you guys then have the choice to enter into one of these 20-year net energy billing credit agreements. And uh, what, the way we've structured our fee is a, a revenue share of the savings that you retain over the life of this project. Um, and that depends on your commitment level, but I, I think we're at uh, I think we're at a 10% revenue share, right? So, if you guys save $100,000 in a year, uh, we we take $10,000 per year. What do you base the savings comparison from? Yep. Yeah. You know, so I, I'll get that get to that. I mean that it's it's actually just plain and simple like net savings from this program, and I'll explain how that works. Um, but for that work and over the course of the 20 years, uh, we are also going to audit every one of your utility invoices. I mentioned these credits are going to flow through the utility invoices. You're also going to receive invoices from the developers where you have to write a check to them for the production from these facilities. We are going to audit that whole process to make sure that you're being charged correctly and credited correctly. Um, and, and do all that administration for the 20 years. And what, is this all your, what else is your company responsible for other than this consortium? Uh, yeah, so th this is, uh, in addition to this work, as Todd described, we uh, help with strategic energy procurement for the district. So we help, uh, con we, we, we go out to bid, we, uh, through a competitive bidding process, um, source electricity supply, natural gas supply, and a small bit of heating oil supply for the district. So um, procurement, energy procurement. And then I'll get to some of your Done questions. <laughs> no, good stop, question. stop staring at me. <laughs> I'm going to jump into uh, kind of the, the legislation piece here, which was um, essentially the signing of this bill, LD-1711, which updates the net energy billing credits program. Uh, net energy billing under LD-1711 essentially establishes a, uh, a rate of compensation for any renewable <laughs> energy system that puts electricity onto the grid. So this is, the distinction to make is it's, this is not what we say behind the meter, it's not energy that's being produced on site. This is energy that goes directly onto the grid that you own in essence. And this legislation creates uh, a value for that electricity that um, you know, is, is high. It's, it's very valuable the way the legislation was written. Um, and that's in, in essence what we're taking advantage of here. Um, so that legislation basically defines the value of energy put onto the grid at 75% of a small general service customer's uh, delivery charges, plus all of the standard offer supply charges. Um, and you know, just, for, just so you're aware, that, that value is about 13 cents per kilowatt hour right now, so any electricity that gets put onto the grid from a renewable energy system that qualifies under energy billing produces credits at 13 cents a kilowatt hour. So that is the piece of legislation that's changed around. I'm not sure this, I'm not, uh, I don't have a good flow to these slides, but um, here we are, here, here we are here on, on slide um, so just to reiterate, this, the credit under net energy billing and, and this new legislation will be indexed to the price of electricity. And there are two, com two components to the price of electricity. One is the delivery component, which is what you pay to central main power. The other component is the supply cost, which is the actual cost of the electrons. And the credit rate is indexed to those two cost components of electricity under this legislation. That credit rate is going to change every year. But in December, it's been established for 2020. And what you see up here in, 
So under the CMP column is the credit rates that you would receive uh, for each of your different accounts. And, and you have a mix of, you know, you have two large, two what are considered large accounts, uh, Wentworth and the high school, and then you have some medium and some small accounts as well. So overall, the credits that you receive from these facilities are, are expected to be in 2020 or would be 13 cents a kilowatt. So that's what we're getting back. That's what you get issued for every kilowatt hour generated from the systems, the projects. Mm -hmm. You will receive a credit. You know, if it's 100,000 kilowatt hours in a year, you would receive $13,000 in credits on your utility. And then how much do you anticipate then paying yep. for the to the project owners? Good question. Whoever? So we have uh, 25 different projects pricing uh, on average will be somewhere in the low eight cent range. So for every kilowatt hour generated, there's 100,000 kilowatt hours. Uh, let's say it's eight cents, you will pay back the developers $8,000. So you're receiving $13,000 in utility credits, you pay back $8,000 to the developer, and you retain 5,000 as your savings. And, and that goes back to your question about how are you, how are we going to count that? Mm -hmm. um, it's as simple as that. And then, but then, ten percent from that. So right, our fee would be pulled out of that amount. Yeah. Yeah. Out of the savings amount, or out, out of, of okay. just the five thousand. Right. right. Out of five, so, what did, what would a utility bill look like? Your utility. So that's a great question. Because we you, still have to pay CMP for our yeah, power. You are. Your, okay. All of your utility bills essentially will have all the same line items that are on there now. The only difference is there's going to be, let's say it's a $13,000 credit. Mm -hmm. So what you pay to Central Maine Power is going to drop nearly to, I mean, it's going to drop by 60 or 70% what mm -hmm. you actually pay to the utility. But then you're going to have this other you know, payment due to the uh, solar developers. Right. Yep. Yeah. What, who sets the credit rate, and how does that vary? What, what are the factors that cause that to vary? Yep, that's mm -hmm. a great question. So I'll just read, you know, and, and the answer is in, the, in this slide that's in front of us here. Um, but the credit rate is going to be established by the Public Utilities Commission. And the credit is based on um, the CMP charge for a small general service customer. This is a, like a, a commercial account rate class that, um, you know, this is somewhat arbitrary, but it's 75% of the cost of the delivery charges for a small general service customer of CMP. It is completely arbitrary, but this is what it is. 75% of the delivery costs. Plus all of the supply charges for the standard offer customer. So, and the, I'm explaining this, but you, you may not know what standard offer is. Okay. This yeah, is essentially <laughs> the default uh, supply rate for any customer that is not in the third party supply market. So, if you pay a utility, if you pay a, a bill to Central Main Power, there's going to be standard offer supply charges on the third page of that bill. That's for a residential customer or customers that are not in the third party market. They get the default rate for electricity supply. And this credit rate is indexed to that default rate. And that rate would change if you're affiliated with something like Efficiency Main, right? Because doesn't, doesn't that change yes. in the standard? No. Uh, well, the rate, so, your so, rate would. So I follow right. where you're going with this. Sure. But since the school department is contracted <clears throat> with a third party supplier, your actual cost or liability to central main power is going to change. However, this is independent of that. Right. You're going to pay, you're going to continue to pay all your central main power charges, but receive a credit that's indexed to, <laughs> mm. I'm putting it one particular screen, but it's indexed to this credit rate. Mm. So the, the credit is statutorily. Defined for That's the correct. next 20 years. That's correct. Okay. 
And, and the it, credit comes right off of your CMP bill? Correct. It will be month? applied to the, all... There's going to be a certain volume of credits that we may need to spread across okay. multiple bills. So do you yeah. spread it out like equally over the year or something such as that? Yeah, what we'll do is probably assign, you know, so we're going to take a, an account like the high school. Let's say they're, the costs at the high school are $100,000 per year. Mm -hmm. And we anticipate the credit rate of $13,000, yeah. or excuse me, $13, 13 cents per kilowatt hour. We're going to we're going to apply the amount of credit that would probably be eighty percent of that hundred thousand, mm -hmm. so that we're never developing a negative balance on that central main power. Right. Because if you develop a, cent a negative balance, they're not going to write you a check. Right. Um, those credits will expire after a year if you let them roll. Mm -hmm. And so part of our work is to be auditing that and mm -hmm. making sure that you don't develop any negative balance. Right. So, I, I don't know how I lost the, this my understanding of this, but I understand the credit rating, but the pricing, is that the, the, the eight cents, is that fixed for the yep. entire so time? Yep, so that'll be fixed with no escalator for the 20 years. Thank you. Okay. But this credit rate will float right. essentially with the price of electricity. So okay. if electricity prices go up, um, and I'll get to this as one of the risks of this. Uh, okay. the, the concern often voiced is that, okay, well, if electricity prices drop by 40%, so now the credit rate is on par with what you're paying the developer, you know, there's potential for this deal to mm -hmm. flip negative. But the, the, the way we see it, if electricity prices drop by 40%, your electricity prices have dropped by 40%. So... It's a less of a cost that the schools have to pay, right? Like, and, and that's the number where, where we would have to take a loss is 40%. If costs dropped more than 40%, that's when <coughs> the you would be paying the developer more than you're receiving in mm -hmm. credit. Going back to the expiring credits. Yep. So if the high school has a bunch of credits, yep. Can those be moved across other accounts within our district, or are they always assigned to that yep. one invoice? Good question. They Once they're received on the bill, they cannot be transferred to other accounts. Oh. But they will roll for 12 months. They'll roll forward for 12 months. And we would not be looking to buy 100% of Correct. our usage. Yeah, okay. we, so we would be looking thank you. in a conservative way. Yeah, nor, okay. nor are we going to apply 100% of what of your utility liability to any one account. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of two levels to this. Subscription okay. overall is going to be a, a portion of your total costs, anticipating that if your costs, for whatever reason, drop down, mm -hmm. we don't want to be buying more credits than you can take. Right. And at the account level, we don't want to accrue credits that can't be pulled out. And, and that's something that we will monitor. Okay. And we worked with them to come up with what seems to be a conservative estimate and takes into account the fact that we may be uh, taking advantage of energy savings for changing out fixtures so we become more energy efficient. Um, even the group that I just met with close three schools and open one, which is really efficient. Um, we've taken all those types of things into consideration such that we don't get into that lopsided kind of arrangement. When you say we, Todd, who? Uh, Charlie and, and the folks at Competitive Energy Services and I have talked. And they they have painful uh, detail of what we spend every year uh, at each facility because every year we bid out our electricity they know exactly what our historical use has been. And we also had a chance to connect Todd and I with one of our attorneys from Drummond and Woodsum, and they're working with a few other school districts and um, organizations mm -hmm. on this as well. Yep. Has Kate has Kate met as part of that process yet? Uh, Not in this particular conversation, but I've been in on all of the other ones. Oh. Really, really long emails. <laughs> For me? Yeah. Good night, good night stand reading. <laughs> Sorry, I Charlie. understand three quarters of what you say mostly. Mm -hmm. Well, Charlie's right. It's a complicated. It's complicated. If you don't live it every day like they do, it's complicated. 
and I can't say that you've answered my questions at least a dozen times over this process because it just takes a while for, for you to absorb it and understand it fully and it's, it's one of those things where I keep asking and Charlie thankfully keeps answering. <laughs> um, but it is complicated and if you don't live it every day, then it just feels cumbersome. So, so the bottom line is that that 3,000 number that you have us down for is a conservative estimate of our usage Correct. and that you don't think that anything that's coming down the pipe would put us under that. Okay. So I, I can get into the next slide here. Oh. The, at the bottom of this slide, you know, I highlighted the total electric load annually for the, uh, for the district at 4,900 megawatt hours or 4.9 million kilowatt hours per year. And um, we've started, our starting point for Scarborough is we're in the neighborhood of 65% of that. Uh, we've, we've got, somebody could probably correct me on that. It's, uh, we've, we've put in 3,000, 3 million kilowatt hours as your commitment to this project. So we, we, we agree that that's conservative. There's, you know, we, we if you'd like, we could probably bump that up to you know, 75 percent or so. Um, if that was the can it be moved after the agreement is initiated? No. So once we go in, that that's yeah. what we get. That's right. Okay. One of the reasons I've I've been in favor of staying this more conservative route is that we have a lot of aging electrical fixtures in our district mm -hmm. that simple conversions save you, you know, 60 percent of your electrical consumption. So if we were to say, relamp the entire high school, which is a huge building, but if, let's just say over the next five years, I change out every fixture to a high efficiency LED fixture, that's gonna make the electrical load at the high school go down significantly. Gotcha. Um, and there are other ways to save energy, but that's just an example that we can all now look up and say, oh, there's a light, let's change it out and we save 40% or whatever. So um, there's a lot of that work yet to be done. Okay. So, and then there's the prospect of a new school possibly down the road, and those tend to be more electrically efficient as well. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so just to speak to kind of the savings potential here, this, uh, this differential that I've described between the kind of the 13 cents and eight cents I think is the best case scenario you know, over the life of this project we're I, on this slide we're being far more <coughs> conservative uh, projecting essentially two cents per kilowatt hour savings or twenty dollars per kilowatt hour and you know on the utility bill credits that would equate to about sixty thousand per year but the actual numbers that i just shared to you would probably be more like double that uh, the difference between 13 cents and 8 cents is about $50 a megawatt hour, so you can quickly do the math. Um, you know, I've tried to be conservative with Todd this whole time to keep his excitement level down. Uh, but, How'd that work out? <laughs> but, you know, but we're also trying to project over the 20 years of the agreement. You know, the worst case scenario is that, really, the, literally the worst case scenario is that energy prices drop. And then you know, we're all paying less for electricity, which isn't the worst case scenario. But we see this as a good hedge in, in the case that energy prices go up, um, the savings will continue to increase accordingly. Um, in addition, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that there are environmental uh, claims and attributes that the district will own. Um, the value of those is also stated pretty conservatively here. If you just did decide to sell those, you know, if you were selling them today, they'd be worth about $40 per megawatt hour. Um, so that's additional revenue that you can give back to Todd for his relamping projects and you know, other efficiency projects to help you reduce consumption. I think this sort of money is best applied to those types of projects. I, I don't really understand that so that so 
If if you if we can sell the assets. Uh, attributes. Yeah, this is a environmental attribute. Yeah. I don't. What is that? Um, well, it's one of the vocab words I wrote down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Essentially, it's a, a claim to the carbon benefit of 1,000 kilowatt hours produced from a renewable energy system. Claim for what? Taxes? I don't get it. <laughs> I still don't yeah, get it. Say that again. Environmental attribute is. Yep. So uh, here in New England, we have we are in a compliance marketplace for electricity. In other words, there's a certain amount of every electricity retailer's uh, s electricity sales that must come from renewables. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a this is a point that I haven't really gone through, so I apologize, but. Um, we have a renewable portfolio standard in Maine today. It's a state law that requires 40% of the electricity that you buy today to come from renewable energy. Okay. This is something that we heard from Governor Mills talk about just the other day. She's passed another law, uh, LD 1494, that expands that 40% to 80% by 2030. So in the next 10 years, doing nothing, we will double the amount of uh, renewable electricity that you get at home and in all of our businesses. That will double the amount of renewable Sorry. electricity that everybody buys under that state law. Okay? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot of power plants that are natural gas fired. So what is, what is it? There's nothing renewable about a gas fired power plant. And for every kilowatt hour those guys sell, for every hundred of them they have to sell, they have to go out and buy 40, or maybe in 10 years it'll be 80, renewable energy credits to offset their 100% fossil fuel electricity generation. Does that make sense? And, and there's a marketplace for these attributes which are traded amongst people who generate them the renewable energy projects, and the folks that need them to meet compliance obligations, which are the fossil fuel generators. So what's so, the advantage to keeping them or selling them? Uh, the, it, the advantage to keeping them is the school district can count those attributes towards your overall greenhouse gas emissions and your impact due to your operations okay. and electrical consumption. So, so you, to offset your carbon footprint, exactly. and there's no monetary value. You can make claims well. that you know, Scarborough Schools is you know, X percent you know, right. renewable, or we've reduced okay. our carbon inventory by X percent or yep. X tons. Okay. Um, and then the benefit of selling them is strictly financial. Okay. Who monitors all that? Yeah, there's a governing body, the uh, New England Power Pool, that. It all goes through. Yeah, all the credits get uh, minted. It's like you know, minting a coin. They go into this like system, Bitcoin. and you know, then they get traded and bought and sold. Um, yeah, this is the world I live in. It's, 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 but yeah, for every kilowatt hour that's generated, or excuse me, every megawatt hour, every thousand kilowatt hours that's generated from these systems, you will have one renewable energy credit. And based on your commitment here, we, you'll have 3,000 per year. That you can either say oh, we're gonna we're gonna say we're we're that much greener, or you can sell those. And like I said, Todd has plenty of places probably to put the money, um, you know, to go towards energy efficiency or other. What's so, the ballpark that they sell for? They're trading today at forty dollars. If you if you were generating them today, forty dollars a megawatt hour. Um, Is that pretty consistent? Um, no, it's very driven by state, poli state, state policies. You know, the fact that we now have a, a policy that doubles the amount of required renewables over the next decade, that's going to drive a whole lot of demand over that course of time for these attributes. And Maine is not alone. This is happening in other states in New England, too. We're all competing for these same renewable energy credits. More than likely, we'd be selling them into Massachusetts or Rhode Island, who have the strongest markets for these credits. 
Are the credits like? Like, do you get? Do you get more? It's just like completely kilowatt hours. It's not like. Do you get more credits for being wind? No. Than you do for so if some like amazing energy source comes along that's like totally renewable, you would still get the, you would still, own the same number of credits. I, I mean. It, I, I'm not going to say that any that generation is going to create a credit. I, I, don't, I don't know what you envision. I mean, wind and solar, yeah. um, right. okay. you know, there, there are different categories. In other words, you know, like, like EcoMaine, they produce renewable energy credits for right. burning trash. That's not treated the same as a solar renewable energy credit. Okay. So there are different categories. This is the purest. The purest, <laughs> right. Okay. So big financial opportunity. So Charlie, overall, based on the number of 3,000 megawatt hours, and if we were to participate in this consortium in the first year, what could we look at for total savings if we cashed in our RECs instead of patting ourselves on the back and saying we're ready. What could the potential be for right. us? Yeah, so um, I, I've stated that the, the credit rate this year is 13 cents a kilowatt hour. That's going to change in 2021 when most of these projects come online. But if we use this as an example, 13 cents, if that happens to be the credit rate next year too, and we contract at 8 cents, that's $50 per megawatt hour, which would be $150,000 in credits, utility credit savings per year. And then you would have another $40 per megawatt hour or another $120,000 in rec revenue uh, if prices were where they're at today. So 270. And when is your expected timeline in terms of setting that actual kilowatt cost? Good question. So we are herding cats right now. You okay. are cats and we have <laughs> 22 <laughs> other cats that we're making. We're trying to bring to the table and say this is the time to commit. And, and it's going to be over the course of the next uh, 10 days probably where we're going to we're going to drop a pile of paperwork on Todd's desk and say it's time to go. Mm -hmm. um, but until then, we're still having confidential negotiations with these developers until the agreements are signed. There, again, there are going to be 25 different contracts. The, you know, we expect, as it is now and today, that you know, there, those contracts are going to range from seven to nine and a half cents and the weighted average is going to be somewhere in the middle of that. Okay. So it sounds as though we would need to take action at our next meeting based on that, that timeline. Which is why I was sort of pushing this mm -hmm. presentation because there is a time sensitivity to it and I also wanted to allow you to have a period of time to ask questions, do additional research, maybe speak with our representatives at Drummond Woodsum to, to understand the ins and outs of the legal ramifications, right. et cetera. And normally, um, I sign an energy procurement contract for electricity on my own, either a one-year or a three-year contract, and, and there's none of this because that's the way we've always done it. This is a 20-year arrangement, and it was bigger than I've, you know, taken part in before. And there, there are some differences in it. Right. But the potential, that. the reason I'm excited is that never in any of my solar conversations with Charlie in the last five years have we ever had an opportunity to save money. It's always been, yeah, you can do solar, but it's going to cost you more than what you're buying it for. So why would you do that? And the answer is you wouldn't at the municipal level. You might if you're L.L. Bean or Colby College, but we're a municipality. So I'm always trying to save the money, and now... If we have this opportunity, I'm excited. I would agree. <laughs> and, as we, and as we did talk with um, one of our attorneys at Drummond and Woodsum, um, they are representing five other cats. 
And so um, we could benefit by signing a joint um, representation consent with Drummond and Woodson so that instead of being charged um, fully for the rate that we pay as a district when we consult with them, we would share those consultation fees in this project with five other entities. That's great. So it'd be a savings. Can, can I ask another question? Um, the the, the the companies that you're working with to produce the energy, what are they using to pay for the structures? They're building that cost out of their own? Yeah, they are financing the projects. Right. They're, they're going to take contracts from you and, and all the others in this that are participating to a bank and essentially take your good credit and commitment for 20 years to buy all the offtake and use that to finance the development. And so they're getting the, the what, the eight cents? Yes, they're getting, say, the eight, eight and a half cents. And that's enough for them to, like, that's the going rate for anybody yep. doing that? Yep. Well, I, yeah, I mean, the, and again, we looked at uh, 110 different projects. Yeah. Uh, most of them were in the, you know, nine to 11 cent range, and then we were able to pick all the lowest cost ones for this group. And uh, so, yeah, I think this is the best possible representation of cost um, to build solar and wind. And there is the possibility, I mean, one of the risks we have identified here is development risk. The most likely time these projects fail is while they're being constructed. Um, once they're up and running, and, and you had asked about this um, a while ago, once they're up and running, it doesn't really matter if the company goes under. The only way, you know, a bank is going to take ownership of that right. project, and the only way they're going to pay pay for it is to keep it running. And it's not that complex. I mean, you have some inverters and panels need to be, you know, facing the sun. Um, <laughs> so there's not a lot of maintenance, but the development stage is the most critical. Right. Yeah. And Just that's why we think we've hedged that risk by... You, know, you, you guys aren't, you're not going to have a binary result. It's not we're in or we're out. It's you're going to have, you know, diversity across 25 different projects. Right. And, and if any of them fail, um, we're going to do our best to backfill them. And, uh, and if they do, and if we can't do that, your share may be a, a little bit less. And if you look at this, this early slide with all the list of participants that are some of the cats, shall we say. <laughs> Compare us. We are actually one of the smaller. We're a small cat. We're yeah. a kitten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Baby kitty. <laughs> just out of uh, the time. We only yeah. have a few minutes left. Yep. So just wanted to. I, I'm pretty much done. Um, so, any other questions? I have a question for Todd. Have, yes. have the town been involved in this at all? Or are they. They use a they different. With, they use a different uh, energy procurement company. So. Do you, know. you see any benefits of partnering up with them? I understand that there are timelines for this project specifically, so I'm not suggesting them. But I just, don't, I'm just curious. <laughs> I don't know. You don't know. Okay. That's the bottom line. Is I don't know. I can have a conversation with you offline afterwards. That kind of tells you about my experience with um, trying to work with the town. We're different entities. Yep. They're they're a much smaller consumer. Mm. Um, they don't have a high school right. consuming. So they're kind of rated a little differently. Yeah. I would imagine that maybe over time there could be some benefit, but it's given the fact that they're working with a different uh, energy procurement company, yep. it, it wouldn't be compatible, I guess, right now. If that's an easy way of answering it. And it's not for lack of trying, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's given a lot of time to the town uh, to try and bring them along with us. And it just hasn't panned out. Are, are there consortiums like this in other states? I mean, or, or other companies that do them? I mean, uh, None that I'm aware of that are doing this in Maine. Okay. We, we've, uh, our company is based in Portland. We have... 30 people in an office there, um, and 
we've been in the main market for 20 or since 2020. Two thousand and twenty. Uh, oh, <laughs> that's this year. <laughs> you, you didn't set, you didn't set up like three weeks ago, right? For thirty minutes. Thanks. <laughs> Should be our first time. Just sign right here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, we we've been watching this for a very long time. We've actually uh, followed similar legislation in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Uh, where we've been working on these types of projects for the past six years. And then we have a, the, the head of our uh, governor's energy office was hired out of Massachusetts. And all of this legislation is, it's not a, it's a near mirror image of what happened in Massachusetts. And so we're experienced. We've, we've done this and we've built a team that supports the work. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.